Today I'm speaking with Paul Miller, an insurance historian, West Ham fan, and Cubby <laughs> fan. Welcome, Paul. Hello, thank you for having me, Shanta. Hey, Paul, did you know that you have the distinct privilege of being on the Art of Adjusting's 13th vlog? <laughs> well, I hope, I hope that's not a bad sign. To be I don't honest. think so, it, but okay. a lot of people, a lot of people do. Half, yeah, a lot of people do have a fear of the number 13, and there's like this great big word for it that I can't even pronounce, but um, <laughs> that reminds me of the Friday the 13th movies. Have there been any insurance policies on horror movies? And what did that entail? Uh, yes, is the answer they have. And I think all, all movies will be insured. So to get financing in the completion bond, all movies will have to take out a number of different insurances, but one of them being key man insurance. So if anything were to happen to a director or a producer or one of the lead actors in a film and they're unable to continue making the movie, the insurance would pay out. So... If you think about it that way, every horror film character has been insured. So Hannibal Lecter, Pennywise, Freddy Krueger, whoever you can think of. But I guess there's, um, it does pay out, you know, key man insurance. And I think from, from one horror film that a lot of people are aware of is The Crow. And Brandon Lee died whilst filming The Crow. And his family wanted the film to be continued to be made after his death as a tribute to him because it was due to be his breakout movie. And so CNA paid for digital, digital imagery techniques and for stunt people to come in and film the rest of the movie. So whilst it's there for financing reasons, it does also pay out. But then I think for me, the more fun stories and the more interesting ones are when insurance has been used for PR exercises. Mm -hmm. So for example, one of the first that I can find was around 1932, and it's when Frankenstein was released at the cinemas, and the production team used Lloyds of London as a PR stunt when they insured the family of the first person to die of fright whilst watching the film would receive a thousand dollar payout. And then a few years after that, a similar policy was taken out by a guy called William Castle. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he was a, a low budget horror movie maker and he'd used elaborate PR stunts in a lot of his films. So there was one of them where a character from the movie was supposedly stepping out of the cinema screen and he fitted a lot of the chairs with um, buzzers that would give people in the audience an electric shock. But he kind of tapped into using insurance. So he did the same thing and he brought out a film called Macabre and it was a real low budget film and it ended up making him millions. And he used Lloyd's as a, a policy and he put it into the um, entrance hall of each cinema. Mm -hmm. Anyone who died again of fright whilst watching that film would get a thousand dollars. And because he made so much money from it, he went on to use Lloyd's again in other PR stunts. So there was another film that he made that more people know called Bug. And there was a, a bug in that and he ensured mm -hmm bug for a million dollars at Lloyd's so people going to see the film would then be able to see the world's most valuable cockroach essentially so yeah it's, it's, it's used in a lot of fun ways I think he's probably a that's, it. that's fun I think I think that's fun yeah so um you kind of answered my second question if any claims were paid out on those and and what happened but um you know when you're talking about dying of fright or whatever, most people don't know this about me, but I, I do not believe in ghosts. <laughs> and, um, in fact, while living in Arkansas, I've just moved to Kansas. But uh, when I was living in Arkansas, I was a member of a ghost hunting group. And oh, right. so I would actively go out looking for poltergeist and, and, and ghost. And unfortunately I have never seen one. Uh, I desperately want to, but uh, you know, are there any policies about seeing a ghost? I mean, how would we do a claim about that? Cause, cause the adjuster yeah. has to prove up the claim. <laughs> uh, you know, how do we know that there even was a ghost? It's, it's a good question. There's um, so ghost insurance became popular really in this country around the thirties. And then it took off across the States as well. And I think one of the first people to insure themselves was a guy in Cornwall in England. And he was so worried about the fact that if he saw a ghost, he dropped down dead from fright that he took out a policy <laughs> at Lloyd's. But I guess to answer your question, the claim has been paid actually in the first. And I'll try and do this story some justice because it's a good one. But the first claim to be paid for damage caused by a poltergeist happened to the owner of a, a mansion house in Fife in Scotland. And the family are at home, they're all in the same room. And at the same point in time, 20 rooms around the mansion house all caught fire at once. And each room had a bucket of, or a pail of water in the corner of it for if there was a fire. As they ran into each room, 
each pail of water had been thrown over the bed, so they weren't able to take it in. In a lot of the rooms, the furniture had been pushed to the corner. Oh. So they made an insurance claim. The investigator or assessor came out and then ruled that it was impossible for anybody in the house to have started the fire. And it was also impossible for it to be started accidentally. And so he duly paid out a claim of £400. Okay, so because here's my first thought. Okay, you said 1930s, and that might be might be the reason. But my first thought is electrical. Because, I mean, well, you know, it just goes boom, 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 boom. If it happens all the way across, my adjuster brain is going, I'm sorry. <laughs> just believe. <laughs> just believe it was a ghost. It's more fun. <laughs> Especially since all the water was, all, uh, you know, gone, and there's, like, no way to do the water. And, oh, that's... Yeah. That is fun. Very strange. Yeah, that so there is, you go. That is um, a lot of fun. Well, you know, um, we t we've been talking about the 30s and we keep going like back at, and, and further and further and further. And I know that that Lloyd's has been in existence since the 1600s, I think, from a coffee shop mm -hmm. and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, when, when I study insurance and getting my CPCU over here in the States. I was told like the Phoenicians were the ones who invented the insurance um, or invented insurance uh, because of the ships and they wanted to insure their, their boats and everything. So, you know, I'm, I'm wondering about Dracula. Uh, did he have an insurance policy? What about, you know, maybe a homeowner's policy on his castle, something like that. Has anyone <laughs> ever insured themselves for a vampire bite you know because we had that you know what is it tom cruise thing going on a while back so, yeah mm -hmm. yeah no i mean dracula is an interesting one actually because there, there are a few references to insurance within the book i don't know if you're aware but there's one scene and it's when the dimitar which is a ship that was dracula dracula was on board crashed and it crashed off the coast of whitley bay and then there's a scene in the or a passage in the book and they're discussing the funeral of the captain of the ship. And they're doing it as, as a few of the characters are talking. They notice strange happenings by the grave of a, a chap called George Cannon. Mm. So it soon becomes evident that Dracula has occupied George Cannon's grave. And as you'll know, the undead can only occupy the graves of those that committed suicide. So in the book, it also tells you that George Cannon committed suicide because he hated his mother so much that he didn't want her getting an insurance payment on a premium she'd taken out on him. So that's one story that Dracula occupied the, the uh, grave there. Right there. Yeah. And then also that's in it, in, also in the book as well, there's a, another pass, passage where um, the um, Lloyd's agents notify the, the sort of path that Dracula's escape ship is taking mm -hmm. as well. So there's a couple of references to it in there. But to answer your question, <laughs> Sorry, I'm waffling. But to answer your question, that the house, Dracula's house, hell or castle, has been insured. Yeah. So it's the yeah. So it's the, the, the largest tourist. I'm sorry. Who's the insurer? Well, I don't know that, but I'll, oh. I'll try and find out for you. But there's um, <laughs> the, the, there's a policy taken out for any visitors to the castle, but there's an exemption in it that no claims will be paid for visitors to the castle at midnight. <laughs> um, so yeah, and and also <laughs> about. Vampire bites. So Lloyd's do ensure against the possibility of being bitten by a vampire. And it's they they it's sold in around two hundred countries that policy and about sixty thousand people have bought them, but no claims yet. Is it mostly in the United States or with it is. I, I would figure yeah. we're we're a suspicious lot, you know, uh, I think. Yeah. Uh, well, I wouldn't like to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we we did talk about Scotland and I do have a a question for you about Scotland because cryptozoology is the study of you know animals that we don't necessarily know if they exist or whatever. Oh, okay. Um, and you've got the Loch. I've been practicing that Loch Nest monster. <laughs> um, and I and I suppose it's kind of close to London because it's in Scotland. Um, <laughs> so does does he have a policy with Lloyd's? Kind of the same as Dracula. Does he have a policy with Lloyd's? Um, and since he lives in a Loch. Does, does, would that exclude, would the insurer exclude like water damage, for example, or, or something like that? I mean, you're at your job, Chantal, aren't you? I can tell. You know, <laughs> adjusters want to know. And that's what this, this, this vlog is about, you know, helping adjusters, helping insureds understand insurance. And, and that's what I want to do. Okay, <laughs> So, the, the, well, Lockie, or Loch Ness Monster, has been insured, but not actually the monster itself, because nobody can really say what it is or what it looks like. But 
they've been you, you're probably getting the theme that there, there are a lot of times Lloyd has been used for publicity purposes um, one of them was in 1936 again in the 30s that was a weird time but there was a, a guy called Mr Bertram Mills and he owned a circus and he put up a, a reward of two thousand pounds which was an awful lot of money at the time but two thousand pounds to anybody that could bring him the Loch Ness monster alive but he took out a prize indemnity policy at Lloyd's covering himself for two thousand as well so he was covered and then a, a similar competition was run in the 70s and it was by a whiskey company called Cutty Sark and they put up a prize of a million pounds to anybody that could bring back Loch Ness monster alive if anybody could take a picture of it Instead of getting the money, they get a, a free double whiskey every day for a year, which is quite nice. But because Lloyd's insured it, if the Loch Ness Monster was found, it became property of Lloyd's. So I hope they do one day because you'll find it hanging in the underwriting room, which would be pretty cool. I could see the underwriters doing that. Actually, I think the, the brokers would have more fun with, yeah. with Nessie, I think. Uh, <laughs> um, knowing how the, the, the brokers are. Okay. We mentioned, or you mentioned, Frankenstein earlier, and mm -hmm. and so I wanted to ask you, Paul. I'm gonna put you on the spot. Frankenstein uh, is that a a horror story, or is it medical malpractice? <laughs> I think it's one what kind of insurance would that fall under? Gosh, I I, I would suggest there'd be a big med mal claim in that somewhere. I think so too. Uh, and, but, and honestly, uh, you, maybe even a worker's comp claim because the monster obviously would have some kind of trauma at being yeah. dead and then being brought back to life and then being chased by, I don't know, uh, you know, the villagers with, with <laughs> and, and I mean, I don't, I'm spitballing here. I don't, I don't know, but I'm just, I'm like throwing ideas out. <laughs> it's a good point. I, you should start a super norm, normal agency, Chantel. I should <laughs> I should, do I should that. do nothing but claims for super normal. That's what yeah. I should do. That'd be a great job. Do that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> now, you know, actually, um, in transparency, you and I have actually never met before. Um, right. it, we, we correspond via LinkedIn. And uh, that's how we met is that I found out that you are a West Ham fan and I'm a West Ham fan. Um, go Hammers. And um, then I told you you had to be a Chicago Cubs fan because yeah. they are the American equivalent to West Ham. You know, they do really, really well in the season and it just all goes <laughs> pear shaped in, in the extra out season, you know? Um, so I, I've told you the, the story about the Billy goat curse on the Cubs uh, yeah. and it's now broken of course. But um, so what kind of cur or, or what kind of insurance is available for curses? Um, you know, uh, have there been any claims filed on them? Any anything paid out? I mean, because I was thinking maybe the Chicago Cubs, it would have been a good idea to have gotten insurance because I think that happened in the '30s, and the '30s were crazy. So yeah. <laughs> um, they should have done by the sounds of it. Exactly. So, is there are, are, are there any insurance for for curses? Yeah, there, there was one um, chap took a policy out in the 50s, so 1951. And he, he was a, a guy called Eric Deeping. So weirdly, the um, seance happened about half a mile from where I'm sat at the moment, so just up the road. Nice. And he was in there, and uh, at the seance, he was haunted by the ghost of a 500-year-old Frenchman who said to him, Mr. Deeping, I put a curse on you, a curse of death. You will die violently by motor car accident on May the 20th, 1951, which is pretty strange considering he's 500 years old that you knew about That's motor very cars. very specific. But, and yeah. and just, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Was it in French? I mean, like, did everybody understand it? Because it was in I French. Would, it was I, French I, would imagine, I would imagine, though, in London in the 1950s, it would have been an Englishman putting on a very bad French accent. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, go, yeah. go ahead. Okay, 1951 <laughs> is going to die. Far accident. So he, yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, so he took out um, insurance at Lloyd's. He covered himself for £25,000 against death or disfigurement caused by car accident on that day. Uh -huh. But he managed to stay indoors the whole time, pretty much like I'm doing at the moment. Well, yeah. So avoided like any cars, and he was yeah. fine. So away from the money, it seems, but there you are. 
do we know how he actually, I mean, ended up dying old age kind of deal, heart attack, or, I mean, did he end, actually end up with a car accident and like it was the wrong day or whatever? Well, I, I don't know. Unfortunately, <laughs> I don't know. But he, um, one, one thing that was quite interesting. So when, when Mr. Deepin was told that he was going to suffer death on that day, he went to the British Museum mm -hmm. and he looked up the, the guy, um, the 500 year old Frenchman, and found out that he died and he was murdered because he was a devil worshipper. Oh. So there you are. So See, that's weird. interesting. Now that is interesting right there. I mean, that's yeah. the kind of stuff like I would go to Dracula's castle and stay around midnight, you know, to see what happens. <laughs> and, Sorry. you know, I'd get out my voice recorder and, you know, flashlights and do a Scooby Doo kind of thing. <laughs> 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 but um, yeah. So, you know, I want to thank you, Paul, so much. It's been so much fun talking to you about these oh, things. And, and coming in on the Lucky 13 uh, vlog of the Art of Adjusting, is there anything oh, no. that you would like to uh, plug? Anything you would want to let us know about? Uh, yeah, well, I, I recruit. I recruit within compliance for, for the insurance industry. So um, if anyone wants to contact me about that, please do. Um, I'm involved in the Insurance Museum, which is going through a fundraising initiative at the moment or a bit of a fundraising drive. Um, please do give them a follow on, on LinkedIn and have a look at their website. You can register on there for, for newsletters and whatnot as well. Um, but no, other than that, I'm all good. Thank you. Differences. But yeah. thanks, Santos. I've enjoyed talking to you. I have too. It's been so much fun, Paul. I really appreciate it. Thanks for stopping by. All right. Good on you. I'll speak to you soon. Bye.